Ladies and gentlemen, coming soon, a podcast you've all been waiting for. The Movie Podcast to End All Movie Podcasts, a podcast that discusses and critiques the best of the best and the worst of the worst movies playing at a theater near you with a host whose opinions have been deemed as fact by your favorite fact checkers. And that's a fact. Without further ado, let me introduce you to the movie maestro, the tyrant of theater, the gumshoe of review, the man that makes theater employees and Hollywood execs shiver by his mere presence. Ladies and gentlemen, the judge, the jury, the sultan of cinema, Justin Hanson. Welcome to the Movie Wire. And welcome to this week's edition of The Movie Wire. I'm your host, Justin Henson, and welcome to the show. This week, we have four brand new films to cover. This week on The Movie Wire, we will be reviewing Idris Elba plays a genie in a bottle in 3,000 years of longing. A long-lost family member is reunited and invited to the wedding of the century, only to find out that her family are blood-sucking vampires in The Invitation. Sylvester Stallone has been discovered by a little boy to have superpowers and now has to save the world in the prime original movie, Samaritan. And finally, Kevin Hart and Mark Wahlberg are best friends that stir up some predictable trouble during a night of partying in the Netflix original movie, Me Time. Ready for my verdict? Let's get into it. The movie while you're podcast. Oh, there it is. Just you need this. people like me. The podcast for hot and trendy movies. The Wire. Dr. Beanie, played by Tilda Swinton, is an academic content with her life of being alone and her definition of happy. She attends a conference in Istanbul where she purchases a unique bottle that catches her eye, only to find out this mysterious bottle contains a djinn played by Idris Elba who offers her three wishes in exchange for his freedom. Dr. Benny, being a scholar of story and mythology, is skeptical and knows about the dangers of wishes that can go wrong and finds the djinn a trickster. The djinn pleads his case by telling her stories of his past and his struggle he has gone through. On August 26th, three wishes will send her on an adventure of a lifetime. Make a wish. Only by granting you your heart's desire. May I earn my release? He'll be staying for a while. Hello. Hello. Critics are saying George Miller's first movie since Mad Max Fury Road is a wish come true. This is a story of a woman and she encounters a genie. The problem is she knows that all stories about wishing are cautionary tales. I'm beginning to think I'm in the presence of a trickster. It's Aladdin for adults. A different kind of blockbuster. Such a cake hole. Eventually, she does make a wish, and it surprises both of them. Find the biggest screen possible to truly absorb this beautiful film. Would you like this little Albert Einstein? Put him back. Is that your wish? No, it's your obligation. <laughs> 3,000 Years of Longing, rated R. Playing only in movie theaters, August 26th. Now, if you are hoping to see Idris Elba break out and sing Never Had a Friend Like Me to Swinton, as cool as that might be, this isn't that kind of genie movie. This is a Three Wishes movie that doesn't follow the same formula that we have seen over and over again. I'll be completely honest, this movie doesn't shoot for the entertainment cliches, predictable, genie in the lamp, family fun plot lines, and it runs something like you want to turn on at nighttime and let it tell you a nice bedtime story. 3,000 Years and Longing is an adult bedtime story that you didn't know you needed. It's mellow, relaxing, and hearing Idris Elba tell a narrative will make you sigh with relaxation during the view. It's a therapeutic experience that's like a film meditation and intrigue. It stays very neutral towards the audience with a clear message and its mere presence is to tell a story in its own way. It never loses focus of what it wants to be and it maintains its storytelling tone throughout the entire movie. That includes the chemistry between Swinton and Elba and it is very easy to jump to judgment on the chemistry between these two. Within the first 30 minutes of watching them on screen, I tilted my fingers in an L shape and rested my head upon them. With a grimace starting to form on my face with the way they interacted with each other, which almost felt like an HR video for a big corporation on how to interact with your peers. 
but as the story went on, I found myself intrigued on where the conversation was going to. Now, the writing is far from perfect and at times can feel overly preachy and there's not a real ton of memorable lines in the movie. The film is written by George Miller and at times doesn't make his messaging clear in the dialogue and doesn't give us enough information to start the film crime map of symbolism and the way the dialogue is purposely delivered, there isn't a lot of emphasis on the wording as Swinton and Elba deliver their lines. The dialogue is delivered in a monotone the entire movie and if Miller wanted something to stand out, it's lost in translation. We haven't seen much of director George Miller since the iconic, breathtaking, memorable, and mere perfection of 2015's Mad Max Fury Road. That's a hard one to follow. It's like watching Carrot Talk come out after Robin Williams' stand-up. It's a hard act to follow. But Miller has a confidence about him when he makes a movie, where there is a rhyme and rhythm to his camera angles while the cast delivers their lines. His confidence shines through the cast and the final product. Miller is known for his eye of beauty on screen and making it pleasing on the eyes and the senses, but at times tends to overshadow and dominate the screen instead of the spoken word of the script. And at times it makes us shut our brains off and take in what Miller is feeding us visually on screen. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but when you keep the dialogue so straightforward as a cast just reading a story without any emphasis and emotion, it comes across as distracting with the visuals and hard on the senses to multitask. But the film just looks beautiful, even when it's supposed to betray some ugliness. But again, it isn't for no reason. Though some of the dialogue won't be memorable, Miller's visuals are. Idris Elba also has the film Beast now playing in theaters at the same time. I reviewed that last week on the show. I stated that Mr. Elba deserved better material to work with to let him shine on screen. Now, does this film make up for it? No, this isn't a breakout performance. He's good, but it doesn't show the range I know Elba can do. The dialogue isn't challenging for him to execute. He does exactly what Miller's vision is for the character, but it isn't going to be a breakout performance for Elba. As Elba takes us through the moments of his time of his life as a djinn, we see a very damaged character in his delivery, and his delivery matches his pain and hopelessness almost as a breaking point of a character that is broken down to acceptance of his existence. And what is interesting about this, it matches Swinton's character as well, and Assis are are these two characters just broken souls that deserve each other? The dialogue might not show emphasis as much as it should, but Elba and Swinton's character show enough similarities to keep us engaged. Before the film, George Miller appears on screen to thank the audience for allowing this film to be shown in theaters. This is the type of movie that deserves your entire attention span, that sadly there is a danger on streaming platforms to may not have the same attention. I am glad and grateful I got to experience this on the big screen for Miller's vision and the fact it made me keep my attention. 3,000 years of longing isn't going after an entertainment factor, but rather a deep character study and beauty on screen. If you're expecting a traditional formula of cliché genies and magical lamps, you will be greatly disappointed. This is a movie that does run a little long for what it's trying to portray, and with Elba's soothing narrative may have your eyelids getting heavy during the viewing. But if you are committed in a thought-provoking, beautiful film, you will not be disappointed. I'm giving 3,000 Years of Longing three stars. Now, before we get into the rest of the show, make sure to check out the Cult Worthy podcast with my dear friend Antonio. On episode 60 of the Cult Worthy is where I drop in and me and Antonio deep dive and discuss a back to school double feature, three o'clock high and slaughter high. If you're not already, make sure you follow Antonio on the Cult Worthy podcast. He does some very important work to bring some lesser known gems of the cinema to light. Make sure you do that. Don't forget to check out my reviews for movies that just hit streaming and are available to rent or buy now, including Top Gun Maverick, The Unbelievable True Story of the Phantom of the Open, the animated film Paws of Fury, the B.J. Novak film Vengeance, and Miss Harris Goes to Paris. You can find those reviews on my previous episodes. And just a reminder, if you haven't yet, make sure you hit follow or subscribe and leave me a review on Apple Podcast or Spotify. And make sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at MovieWire Show. And now let's hear from some other good friends, my pals Dan and Lou over at Casting Views. I'm Dan. I'm Lou. And together we are Casting Views. An uncle and nephew chatting on random topics. Some heavy, some fun, but we aim to amuse. Don't miss out. Don't delay. Subscribe to Casting Views today. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor and Good Pods. A young boy in a tough neighborhood learns that a superhero who was once thought to have gone missing after an epic battle between good and evil 22 years ago may be in fact living right next door. In this prime video original movie, Samaritan. Wait up, wait up. 
What do you do with all this junk? Keeps me busy. Another long night of crime and violence. Some say it's only a matter of time before the city implodes. I think we're finished here. Go on, beat it. I found him. Samaritan. Samaritan died 25 years ago. That's what they say. You think you live across from a superhero? Do you have a therapist, kid? Kid. Samaritan is dead. I pick up garbage for a living, pal. Samaritan cleaned up the streets. <laughs> you mind your business, I'll mind mine. I don't believe you! Are you okay? I'm cool. How strong are you? Not as strong as I once was. Things start to fall apart when you stop caring. And I stopped caring a long time ago. How come you hate who you are? For some people, it's too late to change the damage they've done. He's hiding something. I want him dead. Really? The things you bury tend to haunt you. Why did you disappear? Hey, old man! Try this. Sylvester Stallone plays an ordinary Joe, or is he a superhero? In this Prime Video exclusive that's available to stream right now. Here is a film that might easily be missed to viewers due to the fact most of us know Stallone's classics, and when we are browsing streaming services to find out what to watch, and we know what the covers of his classic movies look like. And lately, we see something like this, and we just pass by it because we think it's just another direct-to-video or streaming that he usually does in between his big action jobs. This is one of those movies that, yes, can seem a little low-budget at times, but it's a little different and a little bit better than what we have seen from Stallone in a movie that isn't in a theatrical release. The Samaritan, at times, and I'll emphasize, at times, can be clever. This is the type of movie that has a great opportunity to get in the imaginations of our young kids who want to be noticed or want to be a superhero, and it's a great somatic vehicle to demonstrate this. Our main representation is a 16-year-old, Javon Walton, who was originally discovered by Steve Harvey on social media, and his main credit is now the Netflix show The Umbrella Academy. Sam lives with his single mom, Tiffany, played by the lovely Dasha Polanco from Orange is the New Black. Who, might I add, would love to see more of her in starring roles. She has an X factor that demands focus whenever she's on screen and almost overpowers the rest of the cast with her talent. We saw it in Orange is a New Black and we continue to see it with every project that she gives us. Give the lady her own movie to shine. She has absolutely deserved her time in the sun as a starring character. Now, anyway, as Sam tries to fit into society and being fatherless, Sam desperately wants to find out what happened to the Samaritan after his disappearance from the world as almost a distraction from everything else that's happening around him. Sam begins to suspect his neighbor Joe to be the missing Samaritan after displaying subtle, out-of-place behavior. The movie has a recycled concept of a kid teaming up with a misunderstood or grumpy adult to attempt to solve a great conflict, with the adult always trying to naturally protect the child from danger or do the right thing with the child. The main difference between this film and others is fulfilling but frustrating at the same time. Samaritan suffers from an identity crisis just like our main character Joe. The movie doesn't know what it wants to be. Samaritan is raised PG-13, and the tone isn't dark enough to be too adult, and it's not bright enough to be more for kids. The film uses some great color when it comes to its costume and fire effects, but it doesn't fit into this movie because we don't know if it's made for kids or adults. It has some fight scenes that border on the line for adults and adds some language that I would assume would be more catered for adults, including some gunfights. But the overlying theme and the chemistry between Joe and Sam is more targeted for kids. It is a very confusing movie. But there 
there is a lot of sweetness to this story that makes it feel like it should have been intended for kids. I found myself confused on what director Julius Avery and writer Bragi E. Shutt were actually going for. It makes the movie frustrating to watch, but at the same time, for what it is, is entertaining and the pacing is pretty spot on. It also has some very sweet moments between Joe and Sam and a couple of surprises I didn't see coming. And maybe because I underestimated this movie, so shame on me. I haven't had a lot of good luck when it comes to movies on streaming except for a select few. The relationship between Joe and Sam is solid at times, but not completely memorable. Delone tends to give a cardboard performance, but as the film carries on, we start to understand why, and his performance then makes sense. But at first, you're kind of confused on if he's just doing it for a paycheck or if there's a rhyme and reason to his acting style in this. As the plot reveals itself and our street gang led by Cyrus played by Pillow. Asbeck feels like a weak villain to go against with our superpowered Stallone and doesn't put the villain in a lot of situations where we feel the danger. And by the time we hear their diabolical plan, I just wanted the movie to get back to Stallone and Walton so we can see their relationship progress more. The balance between superpowers and villain are not a well balanced here. Julius Avery's last movie was 2018's Overlord was pure over the top fun and we see a lot of that shine here too. But where the issue is, is the style doesn't match the script and doesn't give him any wiggle room to make the type of movie that he's used to. The main issue we see with the film is a script by Bragi F. Shutt, whose biggest credit is 2019's Escape Room and 2011's Season of the Witch, if that can tell you anything. This is a film that would have been better suited by a writer who can take a good concept and turn it into a good somatic story. The main characters are okay to watch, the villains are ho-hum, and the concept of the story is there. But the dialogue from Shutt and the vision of Avery are not on the same page and the friction is seen on screen. It's like watching a Hollywood tug of war between creators. Samaritan has a lot going for it and will keep your attention for the entire runtime. And for a straight to streaming movie, it is one of the better ones to watch based on what I've reviewed on this show. With The Samaritan, right when you think this is going to be a B movie with Stallone, Avery adds elements that make you want to carry on and watch and even smile on the screen a couple times, and adds an impressive, clever twist that we wouldn't expect from a movie like this, and maybe that's due to the sloppiness of the writing in the beginning. The mere laziness of the writing is the unforgiving part of the film, where we get a great ending, but I wanted more from the acts before that. I wanted the filmmakers to decide who their target audience was, and after viewing Doing this would have been a great film to give kids the awe of amazement factor and challenge them to pay attention to movies as they watch after the twist of the film. If you're looking for something entertaining to watch without putting too much thought into it, Samaritan is better than a lot of generic films we see on streaming in the last couple of months. When it comes to The Samaritan, turn off your brain, grab a drink, grab some popcorn, and just enjoy it for what it is. It's not a great movie. But for what it is, it's an okay movie and it's a fun time. I'm giving The Samaritan two and a half stars. After losing her mother, Evie, played by Natalie Emmanuel, is now without family until she decides to take a DNA test. Suddenly, Evie gets a message from a long-lost cousin to join him to be reunited with her long-lost family. But there's a catch that Evie will soon realize that she is to be wed to a blood-sucking legend that has haunted generations. Oliver? <laughs> cousin Evie. You know, my mom always wanted to take me to England to show me where she grew up. But there's a wedding coming up, actually. You should come. Are you serious? Wow, it's incredible. I believe this is one of our important guests. Evie, this is a close friend of the family, Walter Deville. Uh, hi. Hi. Looking forward to getting to know you better, Evie. I can't shake the feeling that everyone is staring at me. Can you blame them? You and Walter seem to be getting awfully close, Evie. What has he told you about us? Ow! Let me see. <laughs> Where are the writing room? As you all know, there has been someone missing from this table. But that once broken bond will be renewed tonight. <laughs> to Eve, my new bride. I want to go home. But this is your home. Get up, prepared. Help me, please! Yeah, dear. Hello. There's a young lady who seems quite distressed.
Now, here is a mix between a less fun version of 2019's Ready or Not and a more gothic version of Twilight that is already bad in the first place. Don't get me wrong, during the first half has a lot of great ideas and a great style to it, but ends up being a parody of itself when you get through the first half of the family reunion. And just like a lot of us, when we attend these events, we want to find a reason just to leave. Now, the film reminds me of just a story a friend once told me. For Christmas, his wife asked for a Fitbit and happy to have he ended up giving her the Fitbit for Christmas, but her birthday shortly followed a couple months later. And after putting careful thought into it and his wife not mentioning what she wanted, he discovered that the Fitbit made a scale for the health watch. Not only that, but he thought he'd one up himself by getting her a treadmill. Thinking he's doing the right thing, he also decides to give her a gym membership. The day of the birthday came. My friend that will remain nameless is smug with confidence after spending all this money on something thinking that she would absolutely love it. So here it goes. She opens up gift number one, the scale, and what he describes went okay with a subtle thank you. The wife opens up gift number two. Here comes the treadmill, and the wife says nothing but cracks a flat smirk and gives a heavy nod. Then comes present three on what would be the finisher. She opens up the envelope to the gym membership. The wife looks at the contents of the envelope and slowly moves her head towards him, and the two lock eyes with my friend most likely not connecting the dots and giving off a moronic grin. From what he described the look to be was something that still haunts his dreams. This is the way this movie progresses. The movie starts off with something very special and good, and then it is full of nothing but bad ideas, and you just stare blankly at the screen, getting more and more angry. The film is directed by Jessica M. Thompson, who here shows a glimpse of her talent, and you can tell the first half of the film is in her comfort zone. She has some very brilliant shots in the movie, especially with Evie. There are shots when Evie is silent and moving about a room where it seems like a nod to the 1922 silent film Nosferatu, mixed in with 1931's Dracula, where we see Evie moving slowly about her room with a gothic feel and a mild sense of curiosity. You can almost feel the director shouting her motivations and movements from the director's seat like in the silent films. There are moments like this in The Invitation that are great and it's a subtle nostalgic feel to those that love movies from the birth of its creation. There are basic feels to the senses in this movie that complement it from what I just listed to the white bright mansion on the outside to the dark gothic on the inside. The brief chemistry that Evie builds with the supporting cast of the film is solid, and they do have some characters that actually pique our interest. The movie build is solid and could have been something very different than what was delivered to theaters. As we see in the previews, Evie discovers why she's actually there, and that is to marry a man she meets at the family reunion. And that is Walter, played by Thomas Daughtry, who does his job by playing the stereotypical vampire heartthrob Thank you to the Twilight series, and no, they are not related. This is where the film itself hits rock bottom, and I am still baffled on what the hell actually happened to this production to have such a good buildup in the first half to lose so much focus in the second. It's utter confusion. We have a unique character like Evie who does a great job portraying a stranger in a unique environment, but then we take a stereotypical heartthrob with chiseled cheekbones and a stunning smile that would make any human melt. Why can't we just have a normal person as a vampire and bank on his personality of seduction, his style of seduction? Why are we banking on looks here that to me is a contradiction of what the vampire character is? And as much as we give crap to Twilight as a scapegoat on this, this has been going on in vampire films for quite a while. During the first half, I can look past it because there's enough to like. Even though you will roll your eyes at some of the dialogue and the character development starts to go on a decrescendo when Evie and Walter are on screen, only you're going at a 10x speed. The movie quickly transitioned without notice like it's a light switch, and it's so out of place going forward that one might just say you would stay just to hope it gets better. The movie transitions into the parody of itself without any notice, literally like a light switch goes off, and then it's just full speed ahead. And that's where the invitation gets more bizarrely out of balance and pace as they leave the entire movie to Evie to carry as there's nothing really happens other than things that we've seen over and over again in these type of movies, which is frustrating because the direction started on such a great journey and left a good taste in your mouth with the characters, but it unfortunately felt into its own overconfidence. The invitation could have been something special if it stood its ground to the tone of the first half of the movie, but ended up being a victim of its own genre. I do give it credit for the first half of what it's trying to do, and it is well-directed in the first half, but I cannot get past the second half of this movie as how rushed and how it belongs in a different movie. It's like they spliced two separate movies into one. I'll save you some time. Watch the first hour, then walk out. 
The only reason I'm giving this a higher review than what it deserves is because of well-executed first half and well-executed look of the film. I'm giving the invitation two stars. It's so hard to keep track and even have time to read all the trending topics on the web. Now there's a new app to help with all of those problems. Newsly is an audio app for iOS and Android. It picks up web articles about the most trending topics on the web at any given moment and reads them to you in a natural human voice. For the first time in the history of the internet, the entire web becomes listenable. Browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. You can follow any topic as specific as you like from sports, science to Bitcoin. You can even follow Kardashian. It will find you the latest articles and read them to you out loud. And guess what? They have podcasts as well. Explore trending podcasts from over 50 countries. The Movie Wire is now a featured podcast on the Newsly app. Download and use Newsly for free now. The link will be in the description of this episode. You can also use one of my promo codes that you will find in the description as well to get you a one month free premium subscription. Stop scrolling, start listening, download Newsly today. The new Netflix original movie, Me Time, follows Sonny, a dad played by Kevin Hart who finds himself alone for the first time in years while his wife and kids are away. Sonny decides to spend time with a longtime friend, Huck, played by Mark Wahlberg, as they reconnect for a night of drinking and bad decisions. I love you. I love you, dude. Sonny, you have no life outside of your kids. Well, my wife is an architect. We made a decision that's best for me to take care of the kids. It's called a system which works. Yeah, you know, prison system. That's what it sounds like. I pray for people me time. What's up, Huck? Honey, baby. My birthday's coming up. You haven't been to one of my parties forever. You guys were so close, and then I grew up. I don't want to spend a weekend with Huck and a bunch of 22-year-olds. I have an idea. I should take Dash and Ava for spring break by myself. You've never traveled with them without me. I am their mother. I will be fine. Honestly, I have concerns. Did you hear me? No. Dash, get your stuff. Let's go. Every parent's dream is to spend a week without their family. I get some me time. Me time. How was your first day of freedom? It was great. I played golf with some old buddies of mine. I went to this underground barbecue spot. Mm. You're good, bro. Yeah, I'm all right. We should go to Huck's party. Sunny, baby! Happy birthday! Thank you, brother. You look good. Oh. Hey, whoa. Hey, guys! Say hi to my oldest friend in the world! Yeah. You, you want a towel? No, I'm good. Okay. This week isn't about me. It's about us. Okay. In the Majestic California! It's our own Burning Man. We're in the middle of nowhere. What a poor potty's at. Right there. That's a bucket. Yeah, they were great. Party over here. A party over here. Hey, buddy. Aren't you a little scary kitty? Oh, my God. Oh, sit down. Help! I got a lion trying to eat me! Help! Help! Oh, my God. Oh! Man. She might be the big cat. Yeah, this is the it. big dog. I'm the big dog. Oh, yeah, big dog. He's not okay. Oh, he's out. He's out. Okay. Oh, I'm like Butch and Sunday just got back together. Oh my God. Way to make the most of your me time. Huh? I don't know what happened, but you're a new man. I did a lot of stuff I'm not proud of. God, it looks like a hot Cheeto. Okay, what is going on? It's Huck. He's always got me doing stupid shit. We gotta do this together. It's always something crazy. I was going like this is too much. I'll see you later. Sonny, let's do it. Open your arms like a starfish. Starfish came back. I told you you could do it. I love you, Huck. I love you, Huck. These are the type of movies that I am so glad they made because it gives me hope that these types of films will urge people back into movie theaters and have them be grateful that they didn't spend money on a movie like this. This movie runs like a bootleg version of The Hangover where the filmmaker should have just slightly changed his name to something like, I I don't know, The Hungover. It would have been just as obvious as an attempt at a cash grab as this film is. When you ask an audience to spend a couple hours of their time with a couple of characters to attempt to make you laugh, comedy timing is everything. Now, we don't expect to always have like a Jack Lemmon or Walter Matthau kind of comedic timing with every movie, but these two just look miserable and bored when they're on screen together. Kevin Hart seems to be on a creative leash and Mark Wahlberg seems to be lost so he plays just the lighter version of the previous characters that he's played in the past. Wahlberg is at his best when he has an over-the-top comedian to balance his comedy out. 
We saw this in Daddy's Home 1 and 2, where he teamed up with Will Ferrell. That movie requires Wahlberg to play the serious character, and the two bounce off each other very nicely, where it makes each character memorable and funny together. Kevin Hart, when he is solo, is where he excels, where he is in control of his own comedy. Hart is naturally a funny guy. When he's in movies, he has this subtle humor about himself and almost suffers from the same team-up syndrome as Wahlberg. There's a seriousness to Hart's humor, where I think Hart just hasn't picked up the right roles. Let's look at the same example as Wahlberg. We have Hart team up with Will Ferrell. The humor bounces off each other. Now, this could be that Ferrell just does the same character in every movie, and he's good at it. But at the same time, what makes it funny is his partner in comedy crime. If we take a magnifying glass to some of Hart's more successful comedic roles, he is the focus or the dominant character. This is where he shines. He has a confidence about him. He doesn't feel like he's constrained when he knows this is his movie. The Wedding Ringer comes to mind with his co-star Josh Gad, who plays a socially awkward guy. This natural puts Hart into the spotlight and delivers a dominant but successful comedic character. And then you take Hart and place him in like a Jumanji movie with multiple characters and give him a good situation, he prevails as well. But Hart requires a good contrast to his comedy like we see in Ride Along and Central Intelligence to be truly funny. Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon set the formula with 1968's Odd Couple and used it throughout their career. Me Time misses the mark on where the team doesn't have a good contrast in comedy style. And that boils down to two factors, which would be the writing and the casting. I think Hart could have had a funny movie, but Wahlberg doesn't give him anything to work with. Now, I don't mean to point the blame at Wahlberg and the casting director, but this isn't the only problem with the film. The writing doesn't really have any funny situations, and that's disappointing due to the fact that the film is written and directed by John Hamburg, who is responsible for writing some classic funny movies like Zoolander, Meet the Parent, Along Came Polly. As we see his writing career age, so does his comedy. He also wrote the film I Love You Man, Little Fockers, and the disappointing Zoolander 2 and Night School. Hamburg stopped taking risks, which made him successful in the beginning. There is nothing really standout funny in this movie. There are some subtle chuckles here and there. There are scenes that try to come across mildly funny, but more scenes where it actually is just sad and depressing. There are a couple scenes of animal abuse that you can tell the joke on paper comes across funnier than the execution and the final result we see. Hart and Wahlberg act these scenes out like they're the most memorable part of the film. And they are, but not for the reason they think. The film screens just negativity, ugliness, depression, sadness, and as the movie goes on, we feel more and more sorry for the characters and the movie, to the point that I really desperately wanted to find something to like about it so I can just make the movie feel better about itself. Sadly, it never came, and I am concerned for writer-director Hamburg if this is what he finds funny now. Even though Hart and Wahlberg's name look great on the front cover, they don't complement each other enough to make this movie stand out as funny. The movie comes across as a depressing look into life and friendship, The chemistry between Hart and Wahlberg is stiff, boring, and they just don't look like they're having any fun, which doesn't make the audience have fun. The premises are recycled and adds nothing new memorable to the mix. Me Time will be forgotten as soon as you view it. It has a relatable theme about growing up and letting life and a growing family get in the way of old friends, but at the same time, by the end, you almost feel worse about yourself and worse about the situation than you did in the first place. Comedies are supposed to lighten your day. I believe this is the opposite of what comedy is supposed to do. This movie is just, oh, so sad. I'm giving me time one star. And that's a cut on this week's edition of The Movie Wire. Again, thank you all for listening and thank you all for your support. You can also show support by following me on Instagram and Twitter and leaving me a review. Until next week, do me a favor and make sure you stay for after the credits to show your support for those that put their blood, sweat, and tears into making a film. And finally, make sure you support your local movie theaters. A verdict has been made on this episode of The Movie Wire by your host, Justin Hansen. He thanks you for listening to the show. You can follow Justin on Instagram and Twitter at Movie Wire Show or visit his website, www.themoviewire.com. Oh, and don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Until next time, we will see you at the movies.